right, I'm right, I'm left, I'm left, I'm right, I'm right, I'm left, I'm left, I'm right, I'm right. In a mysterious room filled with magical objects, like my uncle's basement. Yuji Itadori, a high school student, finds himself bound to a chair, facing a blindfolded man named Sato Gojo, the light skin that took your girl. This anime got real kinky already. As they converse, Yuji remembers his friend and senpai, Fushiguro, showing concern for his well-being. However, Gojo reminds Yuji of a secret execution scheduled for him, urging him not to worry about others. The previous day, Yuji called the Sujisawa hospital to check on his grandfather who insisted he attend his club instead. On that night, a Jujutsu tech student named Megumi Fushiguro came to Sujisawa High to retrieve a cursed object. Unable to find it, like your father, he sought guidance from Sato Gojo, who instructed him to return only after recovering the object. At school, Yuji is part of the occult club with his friends Iguchi and Sasaki. The student council president threatens to disband the club due to its inactivity. In a bid to prove their worth, they claim that supernatural occurrences are affecting students on the rugby field. However, the president dismisses their idea, revealing that Yuji is officially registered in the track and field team. The team's coach interrupts the discussion, seeking Yuji's help to win the nationals. To settle the matter, they decide to have a competition between the occult club and the track and field team. Meanwhile, Megumi searches for the cursed object he needs and witnesses Yuji's impressive shot-putting performance, breaking the world record. This secures Yuji's spot in the occult club, and he chooses to stay with them for personal reasons. Megumi is impressed by Yuji's skills and compares him to Maki Zenin, an upperclassman from Jujutsu Tech. As Megumi is about to confront Yuji about the cursed energy he senses, Yuji rushes to the hospital to see his grandfather. Their encounter is filled with tension, as Yuji's grandfather tries to share important information about his parents, but Yuji refuses to listen, leading to an argument. In a heartfelt moment, the old man imparts a crucial message to Yuji, urging him to use his special abilities to save others so that he can pass away surrounded by people. Shortly after, Yuji's grandfather peacefully passes away. Devastated by his grandfather's death, Yuji packs his belongings and goes to the hospital lobby to complete paperwork. There, he encounters Megumi, who introduces himself. Despite Yuji's grief, Megumi insists on discussing the cursed object found by the occult club. Yuji agrees to hand it over but finds it empty, revealing that his friends have the real object and plan to unseal it. Megumi warns Yuji about the dangers of unsealing the object, as it could put his friends in serious danger. Nevertheless, Yuji rushes to the school, where Sasaki and Iguchi are attempting to unseal the cursed object. As curses begin to manifest, Yuji arrives, and Megumi advises him to stay back. However, Yuji is determined to help his friends and faces the dangerous situation inside the school. Inside, Sasaki hides from the curses, and Iguchi falls under the control of a small curse. As more powerful curses appear, Megumi enters the building and engages in combat using Jujutsu techniques and summoning his divine dogs. Outside, Yuji hesitates but ultimately decides to confront his fear of death, remembering his grandfather's words about helping others. In the building, the situation becomes increasingly dire as more curses appear. Yuji's timely intervention saves his friends, and Megumi's divine dogs defeat some curses. Impressed by Yuji's courage, Megumi asks why he helped, and Yuji admits he acted to prevent a tragedy and ensure his friends receive a proper death. This anime just started and they already jumping someone. Welcome to Jujutsu jumps in everyone. As Megumi prepares to retrieve the special grade cursed object, a powerful curse attacks, capturing him. Megumi tries to defend himself but is thrown outside and due to his injuries, his divine dogs disappear. The curse threatens to eliminate Megumi, prompting Yuji to intervene despite lacking cursed energy. He decides to eat the cursed finger to gain the energy needed to save everyone. But Megumi is worried as this could awaken the dangerous curse, Ryoman Sukuna, within Yuji. <laughs> Nonetheless, Yuji manages to regain control over his body by suppressing Sukuna's power. Megumi prepares to summon a Shikigami, intending to confront the cursed Yuji Itadori. Fushiguro declared that he would treat Yuji as if he were a curse, but Yuji raised his arms to show that he meant no harm and was in control of himself. He suggested they both needed to go to the hospital, but Megumi was unsure if it was a trick from the curse. Before Megumi could decide, his teacher, Sato Gojo, arrived. 
ボロボロだね二年のみんなに見せやった<笑> Dojo explained that the elders were concerned about the cursed object so he came to check on Megumi's progress Surprisingly, Yuji admitted that he had eaten the cursed finger Upon examining Yuji, Gojo realized that Sukuna, the powerful curse, had merged with him To test Yuji's control, Gojo asked him to switch with Sukuna for 10 seconds while he fought and Megumi held his kikifuku Megumi was worried about his teacher's recklessness but Yuji allowed Sukuna to take over. The curse attacked first, but Gojo effortlessly used Sukuna's as a chair and strikes with incredible speed. He showed off his skills and landed several amazing attacks on Sukuna. However, Sukuna attempted to finish the fight, but Gojo easily repelled the curse's attacks and counted down the final few seconds until Yuji regained control. Yuji easily regained control of his body. Gojo tested him further by knocking him out to see if he woke up as himself, indicating his potential as a vessel for Sukuna. Megumi pleaded with Gojo not to let Yuji be executed as per Jujutsu rules, and Gojo promised to grant his request. Later, Gojo revealed to Yuji that the Jujutsu elders initially ordered his execution, but he convinced them to suspend it. Yuji had the potential to be a vessel for Sukuna and could consume all 20 of Sukuna's fingers. Gojo convinced them not to execute Yuji until he ate all the fingers, making him valuable to Jujutsu Tech. After the incident, Yuji visited Sasaki and Iguchi in the hospital. He told them the truth about the situation and blamed himself for what happened. Before leaving, he assured Sasaki that a sorcerer would come to heal Iguchi. Outside the hospital, Yuji met Gojo to talk about his decision. Gojo explained that people were lucky to die a normal death after encountering a curse, emphasizing the danger of curses in the world. Gojo then took Yuji to the morgue, where he collected his grandfather's ashes and decided to swallow the second cursed finger whole. Gojo waited to see if Yuji would lose control after swallowing the cursed finger, but Yuji struggled mainly because it was gross and not due to Sukuna's influence. This proved that he could control Sukuna, a rare talent not seen in a thousand years. Yuji didn't want to be executed and decided to fight curses and digest all of Sukuna's fingers. Gojo agreed and told him to pack his bags. Later, Yuji met Megumi, who had been treated for injuries, and they joined Gojo on a journey to Tokyo Jujutsu Technical School. Before Yuji could be accepted, he had an interview with the principal, who held the power to order his execution. Sukuna threatened to eliminate Gojo once he took over Yuji completely, but Gojo was built different. During the interview, Yuji introduced himself, and the principal, Masamichi Yaga, asked why he wanted to enroll. Yuji's initial answer about wanting to help people as someone else's dying wish wasn't enough for Yaga. Yaga used cursed corpse dolls to attack Yuji until he gave a more acceptable answer. Yuji finally realized that he had to stop Sukuna to live without regrets, and his determination impressed Yaga, who accepted him into the school. <laughs> Gojo took Yuji to his dorm and explained that with Sukuna inside him, Yuji could help find the other cursed fingers. They met Megumi in the next room, feeling disappointed that Yuji would be living nearby. Gojo revealed their plan to pick up the third first-year student, Nobara Kujisaki, the next day. Thus, Yuji's journey as a jujutsu sorcerer began at school, where he would face challenges, discover his true potential, and learn how to jump people, I mean embark on a path to confront the dangerous curses threatening the world. Nobara Kujisaki, a first-year student, finally arrives in Tokyo, fulfilling her dream of leaving her countryside hometown, which she once shared with her friend Sayori. Yuji and Megumi eagerly wait for her outside the train station in Harajuku. Wondering why their class is so small, Yuji questions if he was the third first-year student to arrive. Megumi clarifies that Nobara's acceptance was granted a while ago, but Jujutsu students are rare. Just then, Gojo arrives and compliments Yuji's new uniform which he specially ordered with a hood. Nobara had requested to meet in Harajuku, and her attention is caught by a man scouting models. Fearlessly, she demands to be interviewed by him until Gojo calls out to her, revealing his unusual blindfold. After securing her belongings in a coin locker, Nobara introduces herself as a confident young woman, claiming the boys in their group are fortunate to have her. Though Yuji and Megumi introduce themselves, Nobara doesn't appear impressed. Gojo proposes a tour of Tokyo. <laughs> But instead, he leads them to an abandoned building near a cemetery infested with curses. Surprised that Yuji, a jujutsu student, doesn't know about curses, Nobara is further grossed out upon learning about Sukuna's finger. 
Gojo then reveals that this is a test for both Nobara and Yuji. He hands Yuji a curse knife named Slaughter Demon and restricts him from using Sukuna's power. Their objective is to eliminate all the curses inside the building. Yuji and Nobara venture into the building together while Megumi stays back as it's Nobara's test. However, Nobara insists that Yuji search downstairs while she goes upstairs. Despite Yuji's disagreement, Nobara pushes him away determinedly. As Yuji grapples with confusion about her behavior, he suddenly gets attacked from above by a cursed spirit. Reacting swiftly, he uses the curse knife to defeat the curse. <laughs> Gojo notes that Yuji's craziness to fight curses without hesitation, despite being a normal student, makes him suitable for dealing with the grotesque nature of curses. This field test aims to gauge Nobara's level of craziness. Inside the building, Nobara encounters a cursed corpse disguised as a possessed mannequin. Utilizing her cursed energy-infused nails, she pierces the mannequin's face, forcing the curse to reveal itself. While Nobara may have experience, curses in the city are much stronger than those in the countryside, gaining power from human emotions and strength from the population. The cursed corpse confronts Nobara, but she skillfully destroys its head using her cursed nails. In the process, she discovers a frightened child hiding nearby. Initially hesitant to come out, the child reveals that a curse is nearby, taking him hostage. Nobara knows she should prioritize her own survival to exercise the curse, but she makes a selfless decision to surrender in an attempt to protect the boy. However, the situation turns grim, and the curse threatens to eliminate the child despite Nobara's surrender. In this dire moment, Nobara draws strength from memories of her friend Sayori. Just as the curse is about to strike, Yuji bursts in through the rear wall, cutting off the curse's arm and freeing the boy. While Yuji secures the hostage, the curse tries to escape. Nobara demonstrates her abilities by using her straw doll technique on the severed arm and her resonance ability to exercise the curse. She pierces the arm and her straw doll with a nail, effectively neutralizing the curse. <laughs> After the mission, Gojo commends Nobara and Yuji for their excellent performance. They safely return the boy to his home, and Gojo offers to treat them to dinner as a reward. <laughs> However, Nobara realizes she left her belongings in a coin locker back in Harajuku, and orders Yuji to retrieve them. Despite Yuji's reluctance, Nobara argues that they succeeded in the mission thanks to her curse technique. Yuji admits his strength played a part but believes it came from eating Sukuna's finger. When Yuji seeks Megumi's support, Megumi remains silent, seemingly upset because he had to sit out of the exercise. Sometime later, the three Jujutsu students are called to exorcism a cursed womb, a dangerous and challenging task. Kiyotaka Ajichi, the assistant manager at Tokyo Jujutsu High, leads first-year students Yuji Itadori, Megumi Fushiguro, and Nobara Kujisaki to a detention center. Their mission is to deal with a cursed womb that has been spotted inside detainee Block 2, where five hostages are held. The potential presence of a special grade cursed spirit adds immense danger to the situation. Ijichi explains to the students what a special grade is and warns them that if they encounter one, their only options are to run or face certain death. A distraught mother pleads with the students to save her son, which deeply motivates Yuji. He firmly believes that they must save everyone, and his classmates stand in agreement. Ijichi erects a curtain, a powerful barrier that conceals them from the outside world. Megumi summons his white divine dog, a Shikigami, to warn them of any approaching curses. Their objective is to assess the situation inside the detention center and rescue any survivors. Inside the center, Megumi quickly realizes that they are trapped within a curse's innate domain, a unique curse technique. <laughs> While Yuji and Nobara panic comically, Megumi remains composed, relying on his white divine dog to detect any threats. As they explore further, they sadly come across the lifeless bodies of the trapped humans, including the distressed woman's son, Tadashi. Yuji suggests bringing Tadashi's body outside, but Megumi adamantly refuses. He explains that Tadashi is a hostage due to his past offenses, including hitting a little girl while driving without a license. I see it as just an extra speed bump. Megumi points out Yuji's belief in guiding people to proper deaths, raising the question of what happens when someone Yuji saves ends up harming innocent people. Yuji counters by asking why Megumi saved him in the first place. This argument stirs tension between them, while Nobara becomes frustrated with their bickering. Suddenly, during their heated exchange, a curse grabs Nobara and pulls her through the floor. Megumi is puzzled as to why his white divine dog didn't sense the threat, only to discover that the dog has been defeated without him noticing. He urgently tells Yuji that they need to flee, but they find themselves confronted by the fearsome special grade cursed spirit, a horrifying sight that terrifies them both.
Despite his fear, Yuji bravely attempts to attack the special grade with his cursed knife, Slaughter Demon, only to get his left hand severely injured and the knife shattered. Meanwhile, Nobara finds herself surrounded by several large mask curses in a strange and dangerous area. Megumi escapes the situation by summoning Nu, his Shikigami, and promises to locate and rescue Nobara before she comes to harm. However, Nobara is left with just one nail in her arsenal, unsure of how to use cursed energy. As Yuji and Megumi flee, they are pursued relentlessly by the special grade curse, which overwhelms them with its immense power. Encouraging Megumi to continue searching for Nobara, Yuji decides to confront the special grade alone. Megumi rushes to find Nobara with the aid of his black divine dog, determined to protect her from harm. Facing the special grade, Yuji struggles to hold back the torrent of cursed energy unleashed by the curse. In a moment of emotional vulnerability, he realizes that he can't accept a proper death, breaking down in tears as he believes he will die here. However, this poignant realization leads him to a revelation. He must channel his negative emotions into his fist. With newfound determination, he charges forward, reinforcing his fist with cursed energy and attempting to strike back at the special grade curse. Although the special grade easily catches Yuji's punch, he manages to buy enough time for Megumi to rescue Nobara from the dangerous curses in the domain. At the same moment, Yuji discovers that he can safely unleash Sukuna's power, leading Sukuna to take control of Yuji's body. <laughs> <laughs> Initially annoyed at the situation, Sukuna attempts to revert everything to the way it was, but the special grade curse refuses to cooperate and attacks him. Sukuna effortlessly deflects the curse's attacks and, accidentally, regenerates Yuji's left hand in the process. He realizes that the curse prefers death over leaving its point of origin. Sukuna effortlessly overpowers the special grade curse while Megumi manages to secure Nobara and reunite with the Jichi. <laughs> As Ajichi goes to fetch a grade 1 sorcerer, Megumi stays outside, ready to intervene if Sukuna goes on a rampage for too long. However, to everyone's surprise, Yuji does not regain control of his body. Sukuna waits for Yuji to switch back but is met with silence. A wicked grin spreads across Sukuna's face as he realizes that Yuji isn't switching back to gain control over his body. While waiting anxiously outside the detention center, Megumi notices that the cursed womb's innate domain has mysteriously disappeared. He assumes he just needs to wait for Yuji to switch back. But to his shock, Sukuna, the powerful curse possessing Yuji, appears before him. Sukuna is surprisingly in a good mood, but he blames Yuji for recklessly using his power without making a proper pact with him. He informs Megumi that Yuji can't switch back at the moment, and to prevent Yuji from regaining control, Sukuna callously rips out Yuji's heart. With Yuji's life now at risk, Sukuna has essentially taken him hostage, as any attempt to switch back would result in immediate death. To further solidify his dominance, Sukuna eats another one of the fingers, strengthening his control over Yuji's body. Megumi finds himself facing a formidable foe, with Sukuna prepared to eliminate him without any specific reason. Irony pervades the situation as they are now reversed from when they first met, with Megumi now at Sukuna's mercy. Despite the danger he faces, Megumi refuses to give in and firmly believes that Yuji will switch back, even if it means risking his own life. Sukuna taunts Yuji, calling him a coward who cried on the inside during the fight against the special grade curse. Unperturbed by Sukuna's provocations, Megumi notices that Sukuna is capable of using a reverse curse technique, a powerful and rare ability. Determined to fight back, Megumi decides to confront Sukuna, realizing that without a heart, Sukuna can be forced to heal. He summons Nu, his Shikigami, and engages in close combat with Sukuna. However, Sukuna easily toys with him, displaying his overwhelming strength, agility, and cunning. Megumi tries to surprise Sukuna by attacking from above using his Orochi technique, but Sukuna swiftly destroys Orochi and continues to overpower him effortlessly. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout the fight, Sukuna questions Megumi's actions, asking why he ran away from the cursed womb instead of standing his ground. In response, Megumi reflects on his past, recalling his unfairly cursed sister and his absent father. He acknowledges that true fairness is rare in the world and that karma doesn't always rectify every injustice. Despite this, he chooses to save people based on his own conviction, even if it means doing so unequally. Megumi saved Yuji because he didn't want to witness a good person's death, even though he had doubts and reservations. He believes that such actions are acceptable because he is a sorcerer, not necessarily a hero. 
As the intense battle unfolds, Yuji regains control of his body and listens to Megumi's confession that he never regretted saving him. However, Yuji's injuries become too severe, and he implores his friends to live long and fulfilling lives before losing consciousness. Meanwhile, in Tokyo, four mysterious figures discuss why one of them used a Sukuna finger to test Sukuna's strength. These enigmatic beings can walk among regular people, but only the man accompanying them is visible to others. Later, Gojo meets with Ajichi at the school morgue and learns that Yuji was most likely set up by the higher-ups, who sent him on a dangerous mission while Gojo was away. Furious, Gojo threatens the higher-ups for endangering Yuji's life. School doctor Shoko Iiri arrives, and Gojo grants her permission to dissect Yuji's body for research purposes. Meanwhile, Megumi and Nobara are grief-stricken over Yuji's death and attempt to hide their emotions when they are approached by second Second year Jujutsu students, Maki Zenin, Tojin Yumaki, and Panda. Yuda Akatsu, another second year student, is currently studying overseas and not present. Panda apologizes for Maki's brusqueness and invites Megumi and Nobara to participate in the Kyoto Sister School Goodwill event, an annual battle between Jujutsu schools. With Yuji's absence, Tokyo High needs more participants, and joining the event could help them grow stronger. <laughs> <laughs> Although heartbroken over Yuji's loss, Megumi and Nobara agree to participate in the Goodwill event to honor Yuji's memory and improve their skills. Meanwhile, at a meeting between a sorcerer and cursed spirits, the curses seek advice on how to defeat sorcerers and establish their dominance on Earth. Their ultimate goal is to incapacitate Sato Gojo, the most powerful sorcerer, and potentially gain Sukuna's allegiance. While they believe Yuji to be dead, the sorcerer remains uncertain. Yuji finds himself inside Sukuna's mind and confronts the curse, believing they are in some kind of afterlife. <laughs> However, Sukuna corrects him, stating that they are in a suspended state of existence within Yuji's mind. Sukuna then proposes a deal to fix Yuji's heart, but it comes with two conditions. First, Sukuna asks for the ability to use Yuji's body for a minute whenever he says a specific key phrase. Second, Sukuna wants Yuji to forget about their conversation entirely. Yuji, however, refuses to comply with Sukuna's terms. He fears that Sukuna won't keep his promise not to harm anyone during that minute he takes over Yuji's body. The two continue to clash over the conditions of the deal, and Sukuna reveals that their pact cannot be broken without severe consequences for him. In their disagreement, they decide to settle the matter through a fight to the death. The scene shifts to Gojo expressing his frustration. He acknowledges that teaching isn't his natural style, but he understands the need to train strong sorcerers with progressive ideals to change the flawed community. Gojo believes that students like Akatsu and Hakari have the potential to match his strength and become valuable allies in the fight against curses. Yuji's death is a significant loss for him due to the young boy's immense potential. As Shoko is about to begin dissecting Yuji's body, to her surprise, he suddenly comes back to life. Gojo is relieved to see his student alive, and he decides to keep it a secret to protect Yuji from further danger. He plans to train Yuji privately and get him ready for the Goodwill event. More like teach him how to jump people better, but you know. Meanwhile, Suguru Gido and the cursed spirits gather to discuss their plan to eliminate Gojo. They intend to use a special grade cursed object called Prison Realm to achieve their goal. Jogo is particularly excited about the plan and declares his determination to take Prison Realm for himself and seek revenge on Gojo. The meeting quickly turns into a deadly inferno, with everyone in the diner perishing in the flames. Megumi visits Tadashi's mother to apologize for not being able to save him and offers her his name tag as a token of remembrance. Later, he and Nobara engage in close combat training to improve their skills. Meanwhile, Gojo continues to train Yuji to control his cursed energy. He explains the difference between cursed energy and cursed techniques, using the analogy of electricity and appliances. Dojo helps Yuji learn to channel cursed energy into his fists, but Yuji feels discouraged, knowing that he won't have access to 80% of a normal sorcerer's abilities. Dojo encourages Yuji to control his emotions and cursed energy effectively, which will allow him to incorporate Jujutsu into his fighting style. Back at the school, Megumi discovers that he can store cursed tools within his shadow, giving him new possibilities for his fighting style. Meanwhile, Nobara goes shopping for a new tracksuit. As Yuji continues his movie-watching training, he struggles to maintain focus, leading to the cursed doll attacking him as a consequence. Gojo emphasizes the importance of concentration and controlling emotions during training. 
Before leaving to meet with the principal of Kyoto Jujutsu High, Gojo checks in with Yuji about his conversation with Sukuna. However, Yuji can't recall if he had spoken to Sukuna or not, raising concerns about the potential influence of Sukuna's presence within him. As Gojo and Ajichi drive towards Kyoto, they encounter a disturbance and decide to investigate. Gojo instructs Ajichi to continue driving alone while he stays behind. Suddenly, Jogo appears and confronts Gojo, leading to an intriguing encounter between two powerful sorcerers. As Jogo attempts to crush Gojo, the sorcerer effortlessly dodges the attack, causing the cursed spirit to crash into the road and create an opening. Gojo remains calm and composed, inquiring about Jogo's identity, but the cursed spirit responds by creating a volcano-like head that shoots a powerful magma explosion at Gojo from behind, thinking he has defeated the sorcerer. However, Gojo's plot armor protects him from the eruption, and he easily wipes away the ash and lava, showcasing his incredible strength and resilience. Despite the attack, Gojo remains confident and warns Jogo not to underestimate his plot armor. The confrontation between the two powerful individuals sets the stage for an intense battle between the sorcerer and the cursed spirit. Gojo was surprised to encounter a curse that could communicate clearly, and Jogo claimed to have more plot armor energy than Sukuna at his current level, making him an unregistered special grade. However, Gojo reminded Jogo that having too much special plot armor would cause GG to eliminate you in the future. Jogo accused Gojo of losing heart, but the sorcerer disagreed, finding the situation quite enjoyable. To avoid interference from other sorcerers, Jogo chose a remote location for their battle. He unleashed ember insects to attack Gojo, but the sorcerer easily stopped them. The insects used sound to explode, but Gojo dodged the attacks effortlessly. Feeling overconfident, Jogo launched two more flaming attacks, believing he had won. However, Gojo remained unaffected by the attacks. The battle was far from over and Gojo was just getting started. Jogo was confused about what was happening, and Gojo told him there was an unbeatable gap between them, like an infinity, which basically means his broken plot armor. <laughs> No matter how hard Jogo tried, he couldn't touch Gojo. Taunting the cursed spirit, Gojo proceeded to unleash a barrage of attacks on Jogo, culminating in the powerful curse technique reversal, Red. The force of the attack sends Jogo flying through the forest and into a nearby lake. This harsh beating makes Jogo realize the truth in Gido's warning that trying to eliminate Gojo would lead to his own demise. Gojo decides to do the most disrespectful thing in existence and leaves the battlefield to bring Yuji, likely to witness how to disrespect someone 101. <laughs> Gojo rushes to get Yuji and is surprised to see that his student is making quick progress in his training. He decides to teach Yuji about a powerful technique called Domain Expansion, which is the peak of all plot armor battles. He teleports Yuji to where he was fighting Jogo and explains that his student will learn from observing the battle. Jogo mocks Gojo for bringing someone who could hold him back, but Gojo believes Yuji won't be a hindrance since Jogo is too weak to make a difference. <laughs> Jogo becomes furious and ejects flames from the volcanic ports on his head. Yuji is scared, but Gojo assures him he will be safe as long as he stays close. Jogo activates his domain expansion, creating the Coffin of the Iron Mountain, trapping both Gojo and himself inside. With domain expansion, Jogo's abilities are boosted, and his natural technique charges into the domain. Any attacks unleashed inside the domain are guaranteed to hit their targets. Gojo explains that countering a domain expansion requires either using a curse technique to repel the automatic hit or escaping the domain, but neither option is recommended. Jogo is upset that despite his superior strength, Gojo still looks down on him as a human. Gojo reveals that the most effective way to counter a domain expansion is by casting one themselves. Jogo tries to attack, but Gojo activates his own domain expansion called Unlimited Void. This traps Jogo in a space where he receives an overwhelming amount of information from the universe, leaving him paralyzed. While Jogo is immobilized, Gojo seizes the opportunity and beheads him. Afterward, he dispels the barrier and attempts to interrogate Jogo to find out who sent him. Meanwhile, Gido and Hanami observe the situation from afar. Gido remains hidden, leaving Hanami to deal with the aftermath. Before Gojo can extract any information from Jogo or exorcism him, an attack disrupts the scene. A spear-like plan emerges from the ground, creating a field of flowers that momentarily distracts Gojo. During this distraction, a wooden monster attacks Yuji, and Hanami seizes the opportunity to grab Jogo's head and disappear, impressing Gojo with their ability to hide their presence. Whoa!
Yuji apologizes for letting them escape, but Gojo reassures him, expressing his desire for his students to become strong enough to handle such powerful curses. For the next month, Gojo and Yuji will train and take on missions to prepare for the Goodwill event. However, Yuji has no idea what the Goodwill event is. Hi, Hi, Yuji -kun. On the grounds of Tokyo, Jujutsu High, Megumi and Nobara find themselves doing tasks for Maki Zenin, another student at the school. Panda, their friend and fellow sorcerer, is worried about a meeting with students from Kyoto Jujutsu High because they have a reputation for being disrespectful and talkative. Suddenly, Toto and Mai Zenin, students from Kyoto, appear to confront Megumi and Nobara. They claim to be checking on them because a classmate of theirs died but their real intention seems to be causing trouble. Mai starts making fun of the deceased classmate, which deeply upsets Megumi and Nobara. However, Toto seems uninterested in their emotions and declares that he is there to see if the replacements for Yuta Akatsu, their deceased classmate, will be interesting or not. Toto becomes curious about Megumi's taste in women and threatens to beat him up depending on his answer. He reveals that he likes tall girls and believes that a person's taste in women reflects their personality. Megumi, being an introverted person, tries to avoid the conversation, and Nobara defends him, saying that it's difficult for him to open up about such personal matters. This response doesn't please Toto, and he immediately folds Megumi, considering him boring. Nobara wants to help, but Mai restrains her. Toto's strength is impressive, and Megumi recognizes him as the powerful sorcerer who defeated several powerful curses in the past. During the battle, Megumi combines his new technique with the toad to create winged toads from his bottomless well ability. However, these efforts fail to stop Toto, who continues to overpower Megumi with sheer force. <laughs> with the help of his friends Panda and Toge, Megumi is eventually saved from Toto's assault. Meanwhile, Mai shoots Nobara, but Maki arrives to help. The two sisters argue, and Toto takes Mai away to meet his favorite pop idol, Takata-chan. Before leaving, Toto asks Megumi and Nobara to pass along a message to Yuta. As they regroup and walk together, Nobara and Maki discuss their reasons for becoming sorcerers. Maki reveals her desire to defy her sorcerer family, who has always belittled her and looked down on her. At another location, Sato Gojo arrives to meet with Principal Gakuganji secretly. Gojo holds Gakuganji responsible for Yuji's death and manipulates Ajichi to facilitate the meeting. Gojo believes that unregistered special grade curses and talented students will bring about a revolution in the Jujutsu world. Meanwhile, Toto successfully meets his favorite idol at an event, while three mutated corpses are found at the Kainma Cinema Movie Theater. Yuji Itadori and another sorcerer are assigned to investigate the strange incident. At Satazakura High School, Junpei Yoshino, a student facing bullying from his peers, is falsely accused of staring at their girlfriend's chest. He denies the accusation and dreams of a button that could make those who hate him disappear. One day, he skips school to watch a movie called Human Earthworm 3 at the theater, where he encounters his bullies once again. He realizes they are just using Tsubasa, the girl they're hanging out with, for attention and not because they genuinely care about her. When Junpei speaks up about this, the bullies react aggressively and attack him even more. Tragically, the bullies meet a gruesome fate as they are eliminated by the cursed spirit, Mahito, due to their disruptive behavior. After the authorities leave, two Jujutsu sorcerers. <laughs> Yuji Itadori and Kento Nanami arrive to investigate the scene. Nanami, a grade 1 sorcerer, detects the residuals left behind by the curse technique that caused the body's distortion. Yuji struggles initially to perceive the residuals, but with effort and focus, he eventually learns to do so. As they follow the residuals to the roof of the building, they encounter two curses outside in the rain. Nanami suggests they each take on one curse. Yuji is determined to prove himself and insists on going all out to handle the situation. But Nanami disagrees, believing that moderate effort will be sufficient. Despite their different approaches, Yuji and Nanami seem to be getting along well so far. Nanami views Yuji as a young and inexperienced student who still needs guidance and protection. He believes that true adulthood is about facing and overcoming various challenges in life, not just life or death situations. Though Nanami does not yet consider Yuji a full-fledged sorcerer, his trust in Sato Gojo, Yuji's mentor, leads him to support Yuji on this mission. During the fight with the curses, Nanami openly explains how his curse technique works, which becomes a distraction for Yuji as he struggles to concentrate on the fight and listen to Nanami's instructions simultaneously. <laughs> Nanami uses this opportunity to teach Yuji a lesson in battle strategy called showing one's hand, which enhances the effectiveness of one's abilities during combat. 
With Nanami's swift defeat of his opponent using this technique, Yuji becomes more focused and demonstrates the results of his training. He efficiently channels cursed energy into his fists, using the divergent fist technique taught to him by Gojo, which allows him to convert one strike into two impacts. With this technique, Yuji defeats his opponent, impressing Nanami. They later discover that the creatures they encountered were mutated ex-humans and take them to Shoko Iiri, a school doctor and sorcerer, for examination. Shoko reassures Yuji that they are no longer alive and that he shouldn't feel guilty for putting an end to their existence. Despite her explanation, Yuji is still enraged at the loss of so many lives, which surprises Nanami. Meanwhile, Mahito takes Junpei to his hideout and explains that curses manifest from the collective fears of humans. The next day, Nanami informs Yuji that he has located their target's hideout. However, he asks Yuji to follow a lead on Junpei, who is the only witness to the crime. Accompanied by Ajichi, they find Junpei and decide to keep a small curse trapped in a box wrapped in talismans to track Junpei's movements without alerting him. As they continue their investigation, the situation becomes increasingly complex, and dangerous, leading to new challenges and mysteries for the young sorcerers. Junpei Yoshino used to run the movie club at Satazakura High School with his friends. However, their peaceful time was interrupted by a group of aggressive students who took over their room and bullied them. Junpei tried to retrieve one of his DVDs, leading to a physical confrontation with the bullies. His fellow club members ran away in fear, and a gang of bullies led by Shota Ito joined in on beating Junpei. This incident had a significant impact on Junpei's life. I guess even the bullies in this anime jump people too. In the present, Junpei finds himself engaging in a conversation with Mahito, the cursed spirit responsible for the gruesome making of his bullies. Mahito discusses Japanese wordplay related to the popular phrase the opposite of love is indifference and demonstrates his curse technique by showing Junpei some of his experiments. Mahito displays the ability to alter people's physical forms, manipulating their sizes to extremes, both large and small. He seems to be teaching Junpei about his powers and possibly trying to influence him in some way. Junpei's interaction with Mahito raises concerns about the potential danger and consequences of getting involved with curses and curse techniques. During their conversation, Junpei seems indifferent to the terrible nature of humans, and Mahito encourages him to embrace his hatred. They plan to act together, seemingly forming an alliance based on their shared negative views on life. Meanwhile, Yuji and Ajichi follow Junpei. Yuji is given an assignment to deal with weak cursed spirits called Flyheads to test his abilities and connection to the theater incident. On the other hand, Nanami enters Mahito's hideout, expressing his dislike for killing mutated humans. Despite this, he faces Mahito, excited to fight a sorcerer weaker than Sato Gojo, but still strong enough for Mahito's experiments. Nanami is determined to finish the battle quickly, not wanting to work overtime. During their battle, Nanami notices the similarities between Mahito and Gojo. Both of them have a deceptive appearance, hiding immense power within. Nanami manages to catch Mahito off guard and injures him, but Mahito engages him in a philosophical conversation about the origin of body and soul. While Nanami believes the body comes first, Mahito claims it's the soul that shapes the body and can be altered using his curse technique called Idol Transfiguration. This revelation highlights the dangerous and potent nature of Mahito's abilities. As the battle continues underground, Junpei encounters his teacher, Sadamura, outside of school. Their conversation escalates, almost leading to a physical confrontation. However, Yuji suddenly appears, accidentally releasing a fly head curse that creates a distraction. Yuji attempts to talk to Junpei, but Sadamura keeps interfering. To create a private space for Junpei, Yuji takes off his pants and runs away with them. <laughs> Back in the underground battle, Nanami struggles against Mahito's transfigured humans due to their altered shapes. Realizing that this matchup is unfavorable for his curse technique, Nanami decides to stall and flee down the sewer tunnel to buy time until he can go into overtime. As the clock approaches 6, Nanami's cursed energy unexpectedly begins to rise, surprising Mahito. As Nanami enters overtime, Mahito realizes that the sorcerer has imposed a time-based vow on himself, limiting his powers initially to gain greater strength once he surpasses the time limit. Nanami's technique is revealed, further increasing his power and making Mahito take him seriously. With incredible speed, Nanami considers two options to deal with Mahito. He could try to wear him down until he runs out of cursed energy, but that seems impractical. Alternatively, he could go for a powerful strike and attempt to annihilate Mahito in one blow. Nanami decides to make his move and jumps, using his ratio technique, collapse to strike one of the walls. The expanded curse technique is so powerful that Nanami's punch shatters the wall, releasing shockwaves of his cursed energy streaking through the air. Mahito realizes he must avoid this attack, but before he can react, Nanami swiftly cuts off his own leg and announces that he's retreating. 
As Nanami moves away, the debris from the shattered wall falls on the curse, seemingly crushing him. On the other side, Yuji and Junpei find themselves together near a river close to a set of stairs. Yuji tries to contact Ajichi, but he's occupied with dealing with the other fly-ahead curse. Junpei notices the swirly button on Yuji's uniform which indicates that he is a sorcerer. Yuji decides to be honest and asks Junpei about what happened at the movie theater. However, Junpei denies witnessing anything and claims that he has only recently gained the ability to see curses. Yuji believes Junpei's explanation and decides to sit down with him. Unbeknownst to them, Gito watches from above and is pleased to see that they've made a connection with Yuji, indicating that this encounter might serve Gito's ulterior motives. The two boys engage in a conversation about movies when suddenly Junpei's mother, Nagi Yoshino, comes across them and invites Yuji to join them for dinner. In the underground, Gido searches for Mahito and is impressed by the aftermath of the battle with Nanami. Mahito, on the other hand, is content as he feels he has learned a lot more about himself from the intense battle. While Yuji enjoys dinner with Junpei and Nagi Yoshino, they have a pleasant time together, talking, eating, and sharing laughs. However, as Nagi falls asleep, Junpei reminisces about the love he has for his mother and how she brought happiness into his life. <laughs> Back at Jujutsu High, Yuji prepares to confront Mahito with Nanami's help. As they prepare, Nanami worries about Yuji being forced to eliminate transfigured humans, and he asks Yuji to keep an eye on Junpei instead. Nanami believes that Junpei is being misled by Mahito, and he fears that the curse is preying on the boy's broken heart, directing his anger towards those who hurt him in the past. As Nanami and Yuji proceed with their plan, Mahito and Gito observe from a distance, with Mahito casting a curtain of curse energy over the entire place. Their plan is to manipulate Yuji into making a binding vow with Sukuna by using Junpei. In the school's auditorium, all the students faint upon Junpei's arrival, leaving only Shota and the teacher Sadamura conscious. Junpei questions Shota about the Sukuna finger found in his home, but Shota claims to know nothing about it. Driven by his newfound powers as a sorcerer, Junpei uses Jujutsu to poison Shota. As Junpei is about to deliver a potentially fatal blow, Yuji rushes into the gymnasium, confronting him about the situation. Despite Yuji's intervention, Junpei insists on proceeding with his plan, revealing his determination to seek revenge and carry out his dark intentions, regardless of Yuji's attempts to stop him. The situation reaches a critical point as emotions, powers, and dangerous curses intertwine, setting the stage for an intense and gripping confrontation between Yuji, Junpei, and the manipulative forces behind the scenes. As Nanami enters overtime, he warns Yuji not to go to Satazakura High School, fearing that the dangerous patch face curse might still be alive due to the curtain Mahito cast there. Nanami asks Ino to deal with the transfigured humans in the city sewers while he focuses on the situation at the school. Despite Nanami's advice, Yuji's determination to protect others leads him to go to the school anyway. At the school, Yuji witnesses Junpei attacking Shota Ito, one of the students who previously bullied him. A clash between Yuji and Junpei ensues, but Yuji struggles to deal with Junpei's soft and protective jellyfish Shikigami, Moon Dregs. This Shikigami absorbs the impact of Yuji's punches and shields Junpei, making it difficult for Yuji to reach him. Junpei is disillusioned with humanity, believing that people have no hearts, and morality's rules are all illusions. He reveals that Mahito taught him Jujutsu and the curse technique to summon the jellyfish Shikigami, which he controls with his cursed energy. In the midst of the confrontation, Junpei expresses his belief that indiscriminate salvation is not a reality, and that no one has the right to stop someone else from taking a life. Despite Junpei's distorted perspective, Yuji remains determined to reach out to him and help him find the person responsible for his mother's death. Yuji manages to break through the jellyfish Shikigami's defenses and tries to convince Junpei to change his path. <laughs> However, Mahito interrupts the moment of connection and immobilizes Yuji. As Mahito manipulates Junpei and pits him against Yuji, Junpei begins to realize the darkness of Mahito's true intentions. Yuji pleads for Sukuna's help, but Mahito reveals that Sukuna has made a binding vow, unbeknownst to Yuji, and thus refuses to assist jumping people. <laughs> In the ensuing battle, Yuji's rage grows, and he becomes determined to exorcism Mahito. Mahito. 
Ito tries to force Yuji to rely on Sukuna through a binding bow, but Yuji is determined to face Mahito on his terms. The battle intensifies as Yuji and Mahito clash, with Mahito's powers of transformation and soul manipulation testing Yuji's limits. However, Yuji's rage and resolve empower him, and he gains the upper hand in the fight. <laughs> As Yuji delivers a powerful blow to Mahito, Nanami arrives just in time to intervene. Nanami and Yuji team up to fight Mahito, using their unique abilities to create openings for each other. They discover that Mahito's curse technique doesn't work on Yuji, and for some reason, Mahito can't touch Yuji's soul. Realizing this advantage, Nanami and Yuji prepare for round 2 in their battle against Mahito, with the grade 1 sorcerer Nanami declaring that they must exercise the curse right then and there. Oh boy here we go, jumps in back at it again. The stakes are high, and the tension rises as they face off against the dangerous and manipulative Mahito. The fate of those involved hangs in the balance, and the battle for justice and redemption unfolds in the city sewers of Satazakura High School. After realizing the need to work together, Nanami and Yuji strategize to create openings and exercise Mahito quickly. Mahito responds by transforming his arm into a blade and conjuring a ball of spikes to defend himself. However, their coordinated attacks catch him off guard, and he is unable to transform in time to escape their onslaught. They notice that Mahito's cursed energy stores up before each transformation, allowing them to anticipate his moves. In an attempt to gain an advantage, Mahito transforms into a child version of himself, but Nanami and Yuji remain steadfast. They quickly deduce that his transformations have a time limit, and he returns to his normal size to regurgitate small transfigured humans, which he then mutates to attack Yuji. Focusing on getting rid of Nanami, Mahito underestimates Yuji's determination to save others, even if it means eliminating cursed beings. While Mahito is distracted, Yuji manages to save Nanami in time by defeating the transfigured humans. With newfound determination, Yuji and Nanami coordinate their jumping skills to overwhelm Mahito before he can shapeshift. They deliver powerful blows and disrupt his transformations, putting him on the defensive. I'm starting to think the plot of this anime is about whoever can jump someone first. However, Mahito is not so easily defeated. He activates his domain expansion, creating the self-embodiment of perfection. Nanami finds himself trapped inside the domain, and he reflects on his past while trying to escape. He recalls a defining moment when he saved a bakery girl from a cursed spirit, and this act of kindness led him to become a jujutsu sorcerer. As Nanami struggles inside the domain, Yuji, unable to help from within, fights to maintain his composure outside. He is left to face his own moral dilemma and wrestles with the consequences of his actions. Mahito's domain proves almost impossible to escape, and Nanami prepares to accept his fate. However, Yuji refuses to abandon his friend and breaks into the domain from the outside, exploiting its weaker barrier. Sukuna takes control and ruthlessly attacks Mahito, revealing the curse's vulnerability to Sukuna's soul. With Mahito injured and on the run, Yuji pursues him. Despite their victory, the battle has taken a toll on Yuji and Nanami. They regroup and tend to their injuries, knowing that their dangerous adversary is still at large. Mahito seeks refuge underground, reflecting on Sukuna's power and the impending age of curses. His obsession with killing Yuji clouds his judgment, distracting him from the bigger picture. After recovering from his injuries, Yuji meets Nanami in a morgue. Nanami imparts wisdom about the complexities of life and death, highlighting the ambiguity of morality. He acknowledges Yuji as a sorcerer and stresses the importance of staying alive to continue helping others. The school takes measures to counter bullying, and the faculty vows to expose troublemakers. Sato Gojo and Nanami continue to support Yuji in his journey, providing guidance and encouragement. Reflecting on the events, Yuji vows not to lose again until he eliminates Mahito. His determination to protect others and defeat curses fuels his resolve to overcome any challenges that come his way. He embraces his role as a jujutsu sorcerer, committed to saving lives and standing against the threats of curses. In a serene hot spring nestled within a lush forest, Jogo finds himself in rough shape after a conflict with Sukuna's vessel, Yuji. Gido and Mahito appear, and Mahito excitedly jumps into the spring, relieved to see Jogo's body has regenerated. The three cursed beings discuss their plans, with Mahito proposing the idea of taking a hostage to manipulate Sukuna. However, Gido points out that binding vows must be entered willingly, and Sukuna would never collaborate with them. Instead, Mahito suggests winning Sukuna over by offering him the remaining fingers of the King of Curses. The idea is to support Sukuna's rise to power, envisioning a world controlled by curses, even if they themselves are not there to witness it. 
Both Jogo and Mahito are willing to sacrifice themselves for this cause. However, Gido has a different plan in mind. He reveals that he allowed Jujutsu Hai to take possession of the six fingers stored at the school because he intends to reclaim them. Gido considers Jujutsu Hai's actions regarding Yuji to be too dangerous, and he seeks to undo their plan and take back the fingers for his own purposes. Meanwhile, Gojo and Nanami have their usual banter, with Gojo irritating Nanami as usual. <laughs> Nanami asks Gojo to maintain his upbeat attitude for Yuji's sake. Gojo admits that the mission has been tougher than expected, and it was not what he meant by hard missions for training. Nanami is relieved that Gojo didn't tell Yuji about the finger that led to Junpei's mother's death, and Gojo confirms that he has submitted the information to the higher-ups instead. He argues that Yuji should hear about it directly from him. Yuji suddenly appears, excited to return to school, meet the second years, and reunite with his friends. <laughs> <laughs> Yuji and Gojo plan to make a surprise return to get positive reactions from everyone. But Nanami believes Yuji's return alone will be surprising enough. At another location, Nobara meets with Megumi and the second year students and wonders why they haven't packed for Kyoto. Panda explains that the Goodwill event is not being held in Kyoto this time. Since Yuda Akatsu dominated last year's event, this year's competition is taking place in Tokyo. <laughs> Shortly after, the Kyoto Jujutsu students arrive in Tokyo for the Goodwill event. Nobara demands souvenirs from them, scaring one of the Kyoto students, Momo. Mekamaru, another Kyoto student, comments on how Nobara and Megumi won't be able to keep up with them, but Noritoshi Kamo believes in Megumi's talent as a sorcerer from the Zenin family. Yudaheim, the counselor of the Kyoto school, also arrives and is looking for Gojo. Gojo, as usual, arrives late, bearing souvenirs for all the Kyoto students. He reveals that Yuji is alive, assuming everyone will be thrilled about it. However, to his surprise, Megumi and Nobara show the opposite reaction, not happy at all. Their reactions crush Yuji emotionally as he had hoped for a warm welcome. The Kyoto students are also indifferent to Yuji's return, not paying much attention to him. Principal Gakuganji is surprised to see Yuji as well, and Gojo teasingly provokes him about it. <laughs> Nobara is upset with Yuji for keeping quiet for two months and demands answers. Yuji apologizes and officially rejoins his class. Principal Yaga punishes Gojo for his lateness, and then he explains the rules of the team battle, Spirit Bash Race. The teams must exorcism a grade 2 curse lurking around the battlefield, which is also infested with many grade Grade 3 and lower curses. The first team to exorcism the Grade 2 curse or the team with the most exorcisms by sunset will be the winner. In the Tokyo team meeting, Nobara scolds Yuji for keeping quiet and lies about Slaughter Demon. Panda and Toads try to stop her, using their abilities to communicate. Toad's power allows him to amplify his commands with cursed energy, making his words more compelling. Maki inquires about Yuji's role in the team, and Megumi explains that in a fight without cursed energy, Yuji would emerge victorious. In the Kyoto team meeting, the principal instructs his students to use cursed energy to eliminate Yuji, preventing his revival. Toto gets annoyed and leaves the meeting, while Momo and Kasumi are unsure about carrying out such an order. Noritoshi suggests they attack Yuji together, and here we go again, Jujutsu jumps in everyone the only anime that doesn't respect the ones. Meanwhile, Gojo meets with Yudaheim to discuss the possibility of a mole within the school working with curse users and curses. Back at the Tokyo team meeting, Megumi confronts Yuji about what happened during the two months he was gone. Yuji admits that he lost someone but assures Megumi that he's okay now. Both Megumi and Yuji agree that they don't want to lose in the upcoming Goodwill event. As the Tokyo team heads to the battlefield, Yuji takes the lead, but Maki kicks him aside, unimpressed by his overconfidence. The Goodwill event kicks off with Gojo and Yudaheim addressing the students from both Tokyo and Kyoto. However, Gojo quickly takes over and starts the event in his usual exuberant manner. The teams rush into the forested area to find the Grade 2 curse they must exorcism. Yuji, Megumi, and Maki follow the Divine Dogs, who lead them to a weaker Grade 3 curse, when suddenly, Toto confronts them alone. Yuji decides to take on Toto by himself, while the rest of his team splits up to handle other curses. Although the initial plan is for Yuji to stall for time while the others exercise the curses, Yuji is determined to win the fight, not just by time. 
He launches a flying knee attack at Toto, but Toto quickly recovers and counters with a powerful punch that sends Yuji flying through the trees. Toto continues his assault, and it seems like Yuji has fallen unconscious. As Yuji faces off against the Kyoto team, he realizes that Karma is coming back after jumping that dude from before, and now he's being jumped. Just an average day in this anime at this point. Mai relentlessly shoots bullets at him, Kasumi attacks with precision swordplay. <laughs> Toto gets frustrated with his friend's interference and uses a technique to swap everyone's positions in the area, with the intention of saving Yuji. Toto confronts Noritoshi and tells him to leave, but Noritoshi agrees only on the condition that Toto eliminates Yuji and leaves with the other students. Toto accepts the challenge, warning Noritoshi that he won't hold back, even against his best friend. Meanwhile, Momo observes the situation from above and provides information to her team. However, Megumi's new attacks Momo, knocking her out of the sky. Noritoshi notices this and asks Mai and Mekamaru to deal with Momo's situation. He then faces off against Megumi and Maki, with Megumi's tonfa clashing against Noritoshi's wooden bow. Noritoshi denies having a reason to get rid of Yuji, but Megumi suspects that the powerful sorcerer families might have ulterior motives for targeting Sukuna's vessel. <laughs> As Toto and Yuji continue their intense battle, exchanging powerful punches on equal terms, Toto becomes impressed with Yuji's skills, toughness, and clever use of the environment to his advantage. However, he feels that Yuji's divergent fist technique is flawed. Frustrated, Toto loudly proclaims that Yuji's technique is wrong, and this statement reaches the ears of everyone else on the battlefield. Maki notices Toto's outburst and realizes that it's the reason Yuji is still alive. Kasumi apologizes for her class's actions and explains that she's participating in the event to catch the attention of higher-level sorcerers. In this world, higher-ranked sorcerers can recommend lower-ranked ones for promotions, leading to better opportunities and financial stability for her struggling family. Toto questions Yuji about his reliance on the divergent fist technique and asks if he's okay with being weak. At first, Yuji doesn't seem to care about being Toto's best friend but he asserts that he refuses to stay weak. Toto is impressed by Yuji's determination and acknowledges that this is the correct attitude to have. With this newfound understanding between them, Toto and Yuji continue their fight with renewed determination. Meanwhile, on the other side of the battlefield, Megumi, Maki, and the Kyoto team are still trying to uncover the true motives behind the big three sorcerer family's actions and the real reason for targeting Yuji. As the battle intensifies, each side fights for their own goals and beliefs, and the tensions rise to a boiling point. As the battle between Toto and Yuji intensifies, Toto recognizes Yuji's progress and improvement but also sees that there's still room for growth. He decides to pause the fight and have a meaningful conversation with Yuji about his divergent fist technique. Toto acknowledges that it's a strong technique, but he points out that it won't be effective against a special grade opponent. He explains that the divergent fist relies on cursed energy left behind by Yuji's superhuman speed, and to make it truly effective, Yuji must learn to apply cursed energy at the exact moment of impact. This requires correct control and flow of cursed energy throughout his body. Toto imparts a valuable lesson to Yuji about how emotions and energy should not be compartmentalized in specific body parts, but instead should be embraced and utilized as a whole. Toto's teaching helps Yuji realize that everyone in the world exists with their entire mind, body, and soul. This holistic approach to using cursed energy is crucial for mastering the divergent fist technique and becoming a stronger sorcerer. With this newfound understanding, Yuji is determined to continue his growth and become even more formidable in his battles. As the battle between Toto and Yuji resumes, Yuji incorporates Toto's advice, and his attacks become more refined and powerful. Toto watches with a sense of pride and excitement, knowing that his best friend is on the path to unlocking even greater potential. The two fighters continue their intense clash, pushing their limits and striving for growth in the world of Jujutsu sorcery. Meanwhile, on the other side of the battlefield, Nobara and Panda playfully tease Momo while she's stuck in a tree. However, their lighthearted interaction takes a surprising turn when Ultimate Mekamaru attacks Panda from behind, offended by the term Tin can use to describe him. Momo joins the fray, offering to fight Nobara, while Panda and Mekamaru face off. In the midst of their battle, Mekamaru reveals that he is a cursed corpse, a puppet controlled by someone else, Kakichi Muta. Panda quickly shows his prowess in combat, overwhelming Mekamaru with unpredictable moves and attacks. However, Kakichi becomes increasingly angry, revealing his envy of Panda's carefree life under the sun due to a heavenly restriction that limits his physical abilities. He unleashes his most powerful technique, the ultimate cannon, believing he has the upper hand. But when the smoke clears, Panda surprises everyone with his unique form, 
Gorilla Mode, which proves to be a formidable force. During the intense duel, Panda shares the truth about his origins as a cursed corpse with three cores, two of which belong to his brother and sister. Yaga had assured him that whenever he needed help, his siblings' cores would lend him their strength. Panda's intelligence and cursed energy manipulation skills become evident as he outsmarts Mechamaru, leading to his victory. Despite their fierce battle, Panda offers to help Kikichi in the future, showing understanding and compassion even in the midst of conflict. This act of kindness stirs Kikichi's memories of his friends and his longing to be accepted among them. Meanwhile, Kasumi and Maki have a strong disagreement, and Kasumi realizes just how powerful Maki, the second year from Tokyo, truly is. Kasumi had previously believed that Maki was not very strong and had limited magical abilities, as her friend Mai had told her. However, the reality is starkly different, as Maki proves to be incredibly powerful and easily dominates the fight. <laughs> Naki's skillful techniques leave Kasumi overwhelmed and struggling to keep up. Maki kicks Kasumi into a nearby stream, further demonstrating her superiority in the battle. In an attempt to turn the tide, Kasumi decides to use her simple domain technique against Maki. However, Maki quickly understands and counters the swordsmanship technique, breaking her own spear in the process. Maki's mastery of combat is evident, and she effortlessly dismantles Kasumi's offensive moves. As Maki approaches, Kasumi makes another move. But Maki sees through her strategy and distracts her with half of the broken spear and a kunai. The distraction causes Kasumi to deactivate her domain, leaving her vulnerable to Maki's swift actions. Seizing the opportunity, Kasumi manages to disarm Maki and take her sword. However, it becomes clear that Maki's strength lies not just in her weapons but in her overall skill as a sorcerer. The fight showcases Maki's prowess and showcases why Mei Mei believes she should be promoted immediately. Meanwhile, Mei Mei and Sato watch the battles unfold from a distance. Sato questions Mei Mei about the shaky footage of Yuji's fight, and she explains that animals can be unpredictable, making it challenging to closely monitor Yuji's actions. When asked about her support in the fights, Mei Mei admits she is only interested in making money. Nobara finds herself in a challenging battle against Momo, who flies through the air on her broom. Nobara struggles to catch Momo, who uses cursed energy and fused wind attacks against her. Despite the difficulties, Nobara remains unfazed and determined to persevere. Momo talks about the pressures faced by female sorcerers like Mai, who are under the scrutiny of influential sorcerer families. However, Nobara refuses to excuse Momo's behavior and urges her to reconsider the person they are condemning as a curse. Nobara's strong sense of self and determination to be true to herself and her beliefs shine through during the battle. The battle between Maki and Mai intensifies as they both reveal their hidden talents and past struggles. Maki proves to be overwhelmingly powerful, but Mai surprises her with a hidden trump card, an innate technique called construction. The technique allows Mai to create something from nothing using cursed energy, but it takes a toll on her body. Despite this powerful ability, the Zenin family never recognized Maki's worth and instead focused on her limitations. The clash between the two sisters brings forth complex emotions, as Mai grapples with her feelings of betrayal and disappointment in Maki's choices. As the battles continue, the Goodwill event becomes a stage for self-discovery, growth, and challenging one's limits. Each sorcerer faces their own struggles and emotions, with the bonds between comrades tested and the true strength of each individual revealed. Megumi continues to maneuver through the temple, deftly avoiding Noritoshi's cursed energy-charged arrows. His unknown abyss toads prove invaluable in protecting him by catching the arrows with their tongues. Megumi discovers that Noritoshi's technique defies physics, making the arrows almost impossible to evade completely. Despite the danger, Megumi remains defiant, not wanting to summon another Shikigami as his divine dog is preoccupied elsewhere. Both fighters recognize each other's techniques, linked to their prestigious sorcerer families, the Ten Shadows technique from the Zenin family for Megumi and the Blood Manipulation technique from the Kamo family for Noritoshi. Noritoshi's blood manipulation grants him incredible physical prowess, akin to doping, giving him a significant advantage in combat. Meanwhile, Kasumi finds herself in a comical situation, lamenting the loss of her sword and feeling helpless without Maki. Toge contacts her through Mekamaru's phone, guiding her with the help of Megumi's divine dog. But their conversation is cut short when Toge senses a powerful presence nearby. In the observation room, Yudaheim prepares to rescue Kasumi while Principal Gakuganji recalls his plan to assign Noritoshi a cursed spirit to eliminate Yuji. Unexpectedly, the same cursed spirit appears before Toge, but it's quickly destroyed by the special grade cursed spirit, Hanami, who is joined by Mahito and the curse user, Juzo, in invading the school. 
Back to the intense battle, Noritoshi overwhelms Megumi with his blood-enhanced attacks, breaking Megumi's tonfas and showing familiarity despite the intense fight. Noritoshi sympathizes with Megumi, believing they both sacrifice for their families. He sees killing Yuji as a means to prove himself, but Megumi rejects this ideology and fights for his conscience to protect and save others. During their confrontation, a toad distracts Noritoshi, allowing Megumi to summon his newest Shikigami, Max Elephant. The battle intensifies, but both fighters are interrupted by a massive mass of branches, prompting Toads to warn them to flee. Simultaneously, unregistered cursed energy starts eliminating curses in the Spirit Bash race, signaling a significant event. The situation becomes dire, and the Jujutsu students find themselves trapped by Hanami's branches until Juzo intervenes with a cursed object curtain. The curtain isolates them from Sato, Gakuganji, and Yudaheim. As the battle continues, Megumi recognizes Hanami from Gojo's drawings and attempts to contact Gojo through his phone. Hanami destroys the phone and confronts the students with incredible speed. Toad's cursed speech ability temporarily halts Hanami, allowing them to communicate. Hanami reveals his purpose to protect the planet and urges the sorcerers to die and become sages for the Earth. The situation becomes even more critical as the fate of the students and the school hangs in the balance. Megumi, Toch, and Noritoshi race through the winding corridors of the building, with Hanami's menacing roots hot on their heels. Toj, having honed a technique to keep Hanami at bay, struggled to maintain his resolve. Megumi checked on him, offering cough syrup to soothe his strained throat. Just as Hanami closed in, Toj commanded him to stop, and miraculously, it worked, halting the attack momentarily. Noritoshi used his power to control blood and dealt a devastating blow to Hanami's face branches. The three students resumed their desperate escape plan. Toj would stop Hanami while Noritoshi and Megumi attacked before making another getaway. Their hope was to find help from other students or make it outside the building. Hanami relentlessly pursued them outside, but Megumi sent his Shikigami, Nu, to confront the monstrous curse. Megumi believed Toad's cursed speech could neutralize Hanami's strength, but alas, Toad's throat couldn't withstand the immense power. Without Toad's support, Noritoshi suffered severe injuries, and Megumi stepped in to save him from further harm. As Megumi was about to make his move, a senior appeared, ready to face Hanami alone. With the unexpected reinforcement, Toad's mustered the last of his strength and forced Hanami back. Though Hanami withstood the attack, Maki arrived with Kasumi's katana, hoping it could pierce the curse. To their dismay, Hanami claimed the blade was futile against him and shattered it. However, Megumi seized the opportunity and wounded one of Hanami's face branches with his black-bladed curse tool. They discovered this vulnerability, but Hanami swiftly regenerated, acknowledging Megumi's potent sword. Maki asserted she had an even better weapon, and Megumi handed her a special grade curse tool called Playful Cloud, a three-section staff from his shadow. Maki launched a powerful attack, sending Hanami flying away from the battlefield. Megumi summoned Divine Dog Totality, which inflicted severe damage on Hanami's arm. Maki struck from behind using Megumi's sword, surprising Hanami again. They switched weapons and successfully severed Hanami's eye branches, celebrating a fleeting triumph. Listen. Their joy was short-lived, as a cursed bud sprouted from Megumi's stomach, rendering him unable to utilize Jujutsu. Naki was caught off guard and got her arm impaled by a wooden spear. Hanami mocked them, exploiting their vulnerability when their allies were hurt. Divine Dog vanished, and Hanami swiftly subdued Maki. Megumi felt the pressure to act, but Maki urged them to switch places. In the nick of time, Yuji and Toto swooped in to rescue Maki, descending from the sky. Momo Nishimi arrived on her levitating broom to assist Toj and Noritoshi to safety, confident in Toto's strength to handle the situation. Though worried, Yuji assured Megumi it would be alright, and Panda escorted him and Maki away from the battlefield. Oh boy here we go again I can just smell the more jumps in coming. Toto offered his help on one condition, he wanted to witness Yuji perform the Black Flash, an immensely powerful technique that distorted space with cursed energy in a trillionth of a second, delivering two and a half times the power of a regular strike. Determined to aid his injured friends, Yuji faced Hanami, seeking the right moment to execute the Black Flash. However, he hesitated, mindful of Megumi and Junpei's injuries. Toto noticed this and smacked Yuji, advising him not to rely solely on anger. He guided Yuji to focus and stay composed, cementing their friendship. Finally, with intense concentration, Yuji drooling from the effort, he successfully unleashed the Black Flash on Hanami, overwhelming him with tremendous power. The technique proved successful, granting them a better chance against Hanami. Toto observed with pride, acknowledging Yuji's growth. Yuji marveled at his increased cursed energy, and Toto explained that he now understood cursed energy as an essential ingredient. 
Previously, Yuji had been using it without realizing its true potential, but now he wielded it like a skilled chef with knowledge of how to use the ingredients effectively. In Toto's metaphor, Yuji had become twice the chef he once was. Hanami, too, recognized Yuji's newfound strength and decided to heal his injured arm, preparing for the next round of battle. Toto and Yuji stood together as best friends, ready to face Hanami with renewed determination. Hanami unveiled his left arm, signifying he was getting serious as well. The stage was set for an intense clash between the formidable duo of Toto and Yuji and the resolute Hanami. Hanami summoned colossal roots with an astonishing attack range, catching Yuji off guard with their reach. However, these roots traded speed and power for extended range, presenting Yuji and Toto an opportunity to get close and execute a joint attack. They struck Hanami, but suddenly the roots vanished, leaving them unbalanced. However, they quickly regained their footing by leveraging each other's feet, skillfully evading Hanami's next assault through exceptional teamwork. Impressed by their skills, Hanami recalled a conversation with Mahito, who encouraged him to embrace his instincts as a curse and revel in the thrill of battle. The fight intensified as Yuji and Hanami exchanged blows at close quarters, with Toto lending support to Yuji. Hanami admitted that he indeed relished the excitement of the battle. With the intensity escalating, Toto decided it was time to unleash his powerful curse technique. The battle was far from over as both sides pushed themselves to their limits, and the ultimate outcome remained uncertain. In the past, during Toto's elementary school days, he got into a fight with a high schooler and easily defeated him, claiming that life was dull and uninteresting. However, his life took a turn when he encountered a woman surrounded by a curse. She asked Toto about his type of woman, and their meeting gave him a sense that his life was about to become more exciting. In the present, Toto and Yuji continue their battle against the powerful special grade curse spirit, Hanami. Toto asks Yuji to trust him as he carefully analyzes their opponent's techniques, leading him to believe they can win. However, as they charge towards Hanami, the roots catch Toto's foot, hurling him towards spikes that Hanami had created. Seeing Toto in danger, Yuji tries to go to his aid, but Hanami engages him in combat instead. Hanami boasts that one of them is down, but suddenly, Toto activates his innate technique, Boogie Woogie. This ability swaps the positions of Toto and Hanami, causing the spikes to pierce Hanami instead of Toto. Yuji is amazed to see Toto next to him after Toto's successful use of Boogie Woogie. Hanami acknowledges that Toto's technique may be simple, but it's troublesome for him to deal with. The two friends continue their assault on Hanami, with Toto repeatedly using Boogie Woogie to switch their positions and confuse their opponent. They unleash a barrage of punches that Hanami struggles to break free from. Surprisingly, instead of using his innate technique again, Toto lets Yuji land four consecutive black flash strikes on Hanami, weakening the special grade curse spirit. Toto realizes they have a chance to exercise Hanami now. The battle rages on, and Toto once again swaps places with Hanami to face off against Yuji. They both land powerful punches on each other. Yuji notices that Hanami is getting used to Toto's technique. In the midst of the fight, Toto uses Boogie Woogie to protect Yuji from being harmed by the cursed buds. Takata suddenly appears and talks to Toto about Megumi's injuries caused by the cursed bud. Toto reflects on this and deactivates his cursed energy barrier, surprising Hanami. The duo, Toto and Yuji, continue to push the special grade cursed spirit back to the location where their battle began, near the river. Toto remembers Megumi telling him about Maki's special grade cursed tool, Playful Cloud, which is lying in the riverbed. He also recalls that the trees on Hanami's face are his weak spots. Using his Boogie Woogie technique, Toto switches Yuji out for the special grade cursed tool, Playful Cloud. Hanami responds by absorbing the life force of nearby plants, converting it into cursed energy, and empowering the flower bud on his left shoulder. However, just as Hanami is about to activate his domain expansion, Yuji rushes over to Toto, who instructs him to stop moving. At that moment, the curtain above them disappears, and Sato Gojo is revealed to be floating above the battlefield. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the battle, Gakugenji continues to face off against the curse user, Juzo Kumia. Juzo realizes that Gakugenji is an effective mid-range attacker, preventing him from getting closer. At the same time, Yudaheim is seen running while on the phone, but she is suddenly attacked from behind by another curse user named Haruda Shijmo. Just as Haruda asks what Yudaheim will give him, Nobara and Mai arrive to assist her. Haruda seems excited, claiming he's popular because of how many girls are there. However, the curtain above them disappears as well, and Haruda panics and runs away, realizing that not even 30 minutes have passed since the start of the fight. In the battle between Toto, Yuji Itadori, and Hanami, Yuji is surprised to see Gojo-sensei floating above the battlefield, looking like the light skin that took your girl. Huh? Gojo notices Yuji's growth and believes that Toto and Yuji working together will be okay for a while. 
He then heads off to confront Juzo, despite Gakuganji's plea not to eliminate him. Gojo easily takes down Juzo by severing his limbs and instructs Gakuganji to get Juzo healed for interrogation. Gojo realizes that the curse user facing off against Yudaheim has fled, and he assumes Hanami will do the same. Yuji wants to pursue Hanami, but Toto stops him, worried that his new best friend might get caught in the crossfire. In the meantime, Gojo decides to go all out and combines two powerful techniques, Curse Technique Lapse, Blue and Curse Technique Reversal, Red. This fusion results in the creation of the Hollow Technique, Purple. The force of this technique leaves Toto unsure if the curse was exercised or not. Yay! <laughs> Meanwhile, Mahito successfully steals Cursed Womb Death Painting 1-3, along with a Sukuna finger. He wonders about Hanami's well-being and leaves behind two murdered members of the school's staff on his way out, declaring that his mission is complete. The situation becomes even more complex and dangerous with Mahito's actions. In the depths of an underground cave, Haruda Shijima walked, his frustration mounting as he felt powerless during the invasion. Suddenly, a weary and exhausted Hanami crashed down from the ceiling, collapsing before him. In a fit of anger and desperation, Haruda considered ending Hanami's life, but his plans were thwarted when Mahito arrived on the scene. Mahito revealed that he had successfully completed the mission. In a flashback, Gido discussed a formidable sorcerer named Tenjin with Mahito, Hanami, and Jogo. They debated who was stronger between Tenjin and Sato Gojo. Gido dismissed the need to concern themselves with Tenjin, emphasizing that they must avoid drawing Gojo's attention away from Mahito's main mission. Gido believed that one of the students posed a significant threat to Sukuna and that getting rid of the student would ruin their plans. Jogo suggested kidnapping Sukuna's vessel, but Gido warned against it, fearing the consequences for both their group and Jujutsu High. Back in the present, Mahito assisted Hanami, who struggled with suppressing their killing intent. Mahito was pleased to see Hanami's transformation into a more monstrous cursed spirit. At Tokyo High, Ijichi informed the group that Mahito was responsible for the casualties and stolen cursed objects. The discussion arose about whether to inform the students and other sorcerers, but Yaga believed it best to keep the information restricted to higher-ups. When asked about valuable information from the captured cursed user, Juzo mentioned being deceived by a white-haired monk during the raid. Mei Mei inquired if the description matched anyone known to Gojo, but he denied any knowledge of it. Gojo speculated that the special grade cursed spirit the students fought might have helped the attackers bypass Tenjin's barrier, noting that the barrier did not affect plants and was primarily for hiding, not protection. In the aftermath of the events, the school principals discussed cancelling the Goodwill event. However, Gojo insisted that the decision was not theirs to make. At the healing ward, Yuji and Nobara visited Megumi, who was recovering. Nobara asked Yuji about the incident with Toto, but Yuji claimed he wasn't himself at the time. Yuji expressed relief that Megumi wasn't seriously injured and mentioned his newfound ability to eat pizza. Megumi, although complaining about the food, acknowledged Yuji's growth and confidently declared his determination to surpass him. Toto appeared between Yuji and Nobara, complimenting Megumi's determination and showing respect for his brother's friend. Yuji ran away from Toto, who chased after him. Yuji struggled to explain their bond and how his mindset was compromised during their previous encounter. The next day, Gojo met with the students to discuss whether they should continue the Goodwill event after the recent events. Many students were hesitant, but Toto passionately advocated for continuing the event, presenting several compelling reasons that convinced the others. Gojo decided to modify the event, removing the individual portion and having Yuji randomly select a team event. To everyone's surprise, Yuji chose baseball, breaking away from tradition. The baseball game began, and tensions rose as the teams competed. Kasumi Miwa took the first turn at bat, while Yudaheim and Momo argued about the game's rules. Kamo stepped up to bat and had a meaningful conversation with Yuji, understanding his motivations for becoming a Jujutsu sorcerer. Noritoshi was struck out by Maki, impressed by Yuji's sincerity. Nobara faced the pitching machine controlled by Mekamaru and managed to hit the ball while confronting Mai at first base. Megumi sacrificed himself on a bunt to advance Nobara, and the team appeared to score three runs. However, a dispute arose when Momo used her broom to catch Maki ball, leading the Tokyo students to accuse her of cheating. As the game progressed, Toto stepped up to bat and expressed his desire to face Yuji as the pitcher rather than the catcher.
Mackey struck him in the face with the ball, earning admiration from many but revealing the disdain some had for Toto. Meanwhile, the two principals discussed Yuji, with Gakuganji admitting that he didn't hate him, but the rules demanded his presence be condemned due to Sukuna's potential danger. Yaga believed that Yuji had the potential to save many lives as a sorcerer, despite the regrets that all sorcerers inevitably faced. As the baseball game neared its conclusion, Yuji's home run helped Toad score two points, leading to Tokyo High's victory in the 30th annual Kyoto Goodwill event. <laughs> oh. <laughs> As Teichai returned home, he immediately noticed that the auto-lock doors to his apartment were open. Angrily, he complained to the building manager about the security issue but failed to notice the cursed spirit lurking behind him. Tragically, he was stabbed to death and his profile was added to Tokyo Jujutsu High, a school that deals with curses and paranormal phenomena. Later, Akari Nita, the auxiliary manager for Jujutsu High, drove three first-year students, Megumi, Nobara, and Yuji, to their mission site. Akari explained that there was a common thread connecting the deaths of Teichai and the three students from the same junior high they had attended. The most likely explanation was that the three of them were cursed, and it took years for the curse to fully manifest. During their investigation, they discovered that all the victims had attended Saitama Yurami East Junior High, where they planned to question some classmates who knew them. However, they were shocked to find another funeral happening, and the person they were supposed to question had died in the same manner as the others. The mystery surrounding the curse deepened. Upon arriving at the school to investigate further, they encountered some punks, and Megumi's former classmates recognized him. It was revealed that Megumi had beaten up all the punks in the area during his time at the school. This led to some tension among the first-year students as they realized that Megumi had kept this part of his past a secret from them. Despite the lack of leads, they decided to head to Yasohachi Bridge, a location known for suicides and paranormal activity, to continue their investigation. They learned about a story involving four students who had disappeared and were later found unconscious below the bridge. This led them to suspect that the curse they were dealing with might be connected to this incident. Back at Jujutsu High, Mahito and Gido discussed the cursed objects they had obtained, the death painting wounds. These objects posed a significant threat and could manifest in anyone, making them unpredictable and dangerous. As the first years continued their investigation at Yasohachi Bridge, they failed to find any traces of the curse they were looking for. However, Mahito had forced one of the death painting wounds into a normal human turning him into a cursed spirit, adding to the danger. The situation became more personal for Megumi when he encountered the Fujinuma siblings, who had experienced strange occurrences related to the cursed spirit. They informed him that his sister Tsumiki had been with them during one of the incidents, leaving Megumi deeply worried for her safety. Despite the danger, Megumi refused to back down and tried to handle the situation alone to protect his friends. However, Yuji and Nobara insisted on supporting him, emphasizing their trust and friendship. Megumi finally opened up about his sister's condition, and they decided to face the cursed spirit together. They entered the cursed spirit's domain, where they confronted a mole-like cursed spirit inside. To their surprise, another cursed spirit from the death painting wombs also appeared. Yuji faced the new threat while Megumi and Nobara focused on dealing with the curse in the domain, ready to confront the danger that lay ahead. In the midst of the intense battles, Yuji finds himself facing off against Kichizu, the mole-like cursed spirit. With his agility and quick reflexes, Yuji skillfully dodges Kichizu's blood shots and manages to land a powerful kick, sending the spirit flying. However, the corrosive blood continues to pose a threat, forcing Yuji to flip Kichizu over to avoid the deadly liquid. Undeterred, Yuji lands multiple punches on Kichizu until the spirit grabs his arm. Yuji counters by seizing Kichizu's other arm and performing an improvised dropkick, sending Kichizu flying once more. Realizing the corrosive nature of the blood, Yuji becomes cautious of the surroundings. Meanwhile, in a different area of the domain, Nobara and Megumi engage in a fierce battle with the agile mole-like cursed spirit. Nobara attempts to use resonance to control the spirit, while Megumi wields his black sword to strike it down. However, the spirit proves elusive, retreating into its hole to avoid their attacks. Despite the challenges, Nobara suggests they continue their assault, comparing the situation to a game of whack-a-mole. Megumi observes that the curse's expanded curse technique, coupled with the large number of victims it has claimed and the barrier it's utilizing, are taking a toll on its main body, making it vulnerable to their efforts. Unexpectedly, a third party intervenes, snatching Nobara out of the barrier. Megumi is taken aback but is urged by Nobara to keep fighting the cursed spirit, as she faces the unknown entity who took her out of the barrier. <laughs> <laughs> 
Get. Megumi presses on, unaware of the identity of the intruder. Outside the barrier, Kachizu senses the presence of his older brother and promptly flees from his confrontation with Yuji. Concerned about Nobara, Yuji asks Megumi if he should chase after Kachizu, and Megumi advises him to do so as Nobara might be facing a more troublesome situation. Before Yuji leaves, he tells Megumi to join the fight if things become dire. Nobara, on the other side of the barrier, confronts the mysterious man who pulled her out. Annoyed by his actions, Nobara swings her hammer to keep him at bay. The man is surprised that he caught a female sorcerer, indicating that she was not his intended target. It's revealed that Iso and Kechizu are present, claiming they are on errands and won't harm the sorcerers if they retreat. However, Nobara is puzzled by Iso's unusual anatomy and strange odor, unsure if he's a curse user or a cursed spirit. Iso expresses his surprise, mentioning that he thought the sorcerers were also after Sukuna's finger, just like him. Inside the domain, Megumi continues his intense battle with the mole-like curse. Despite the curse's simple attack pattern, Megumi manages to defeat it with his divine dog, totality technique, dealing the final blow. However, the barrier doesn't disappear, indicating that the curse is not the only threat. Something emerges from the exit, shocking Megumi. He realizes that since June, cursed victims have been dying coinciding with the time when Yuji became Sukuna's host. Megumi connects the dots and understands that Sukuna's release of cursed energy resonated with all his fingers, awakening the bridge curse, which concealed one of Sukuna's fingers inside the barrier. Another special grade finger bearer, identical to the one he encountered at the detention center, stands before Megumi. Sukuna's power has amplified all his fingers, making them formidable foes. The finger bearer launches a devastating blast of cursed energy, easily breaking Megumi's sword. Megumi tries to summon new, but the finger bearer's incredible speed surprises him once again. In a desperate move, Megumi activates his domain expansion, Chimera Shadow Garden, creating a shadow-filled arena. With his creativity, he uses frogs and liquid shadow to distract the curse, landing a powerful kick to its face. The curse retaliates with a powerful arrow of cursed energy, but Megumi uses a shadow fake to evade it. Megumi then summons two news to attack the curse. The curse responds with a large explosive barrier of cursed energy, attempting to eliminate the liquid shadow. After defeating the curse, Megumi and his Shikigami, Divine Dog, Totality emerge from behind the curse's shadow. Megumi points out the power of Divine Dog's claws, indicating how they could even pierce through Hanami's hard shell, making the curse's defeat inevitable. The curse vanishes, and the domain dissipates, but the intense battle leaves Megumi severely exhausted. He ends up vomiting and falling forward, the strain of the fight taking a toll on him. It's revealed that Megumi used to be a bully, and someone named Tsumiki scolded him for his behavior, encouraging him to stop fighting. Tsumiki throws a carton of strawberry milk at him, a memory that unexpectedly resurfaces in the midst of the battle. Megumi remembers how Gojo-sensei intervened in his life when his father married Tsumiki's mother and then disappeared, ensuring that Megumi and his sister were supported by the school and preventing Megumi from being sent to the Zenin family. Megumi now holds one of Sukuna's fingers and contemplates how to inform Yuji about it before falling asleep suddenly. <laughs> Outside the barrier, Iso notices Sukuna's finger and becomes eager to obtain it. Kechizu and Yuji appear behind him, causing Iso to become angry that they caught him off guard. Nobara hits Iso on the back of his head with her hammer, provoking him further. <laughs> Iso activates his raw technique, Maximum, Wing King, threatening to harm the students with wasps. I can just smell the gang jumping and coming. Yuji and Nobara proceed their fight against Kachizu and Iso. Finally a 2v2 not a 1v6 good job for once anime. Yuji cautions Nobara to dodge the blood from Iso's procedure. As Iso's assault barely misses Nobara, he tells the other understudies to run absent with their backs turned. Be that as it may, the lines of the assault rapidly capture up to Yuji and Nobara. Yuji inquires in the event that Nobara can run quicker, but she says she can't. So, Yuji chooses to carry her and increment their speed. Nobara guarantees Yuji that she's got his back as he dashes through the adjacent timberland at unimaginable speed, zigzagging between trees to elude the attack's run. In spite of carrying Nobara, Yuji's speed shocks Iso who realizes how quick Yuji is. In an astonish assault, Kachizu oversees to capture Yuji off watch and spits his dim blood all over him. Yuji acts rapidly and pushes Nobara out of harm's way, but the cleared outside of his confront gets secured within the blood. Nobara tries to assist Yuji, but she is abruptly struck by Iso's wing lord assault as he catches up to them quickly. Iso clarifies to the first years that their blood is ingested through wounds and films, making the circumstance indeed more critical. He notices that Kachizu's blood isn't as dangerous as his claim. 
but still unsafe. He includes that Yuji may have almost 15 more minutes to live, whereas Nobara as it were has around 10 more minutes until morning, after which as it were their bones will stay. The circumstance gets to be progressively basic for both of them. In an aggravating flashback, it is uncovered how the passing portray wombs came into presence. A lady with the special capacity to donate birth to human spirit crossbreeds looked for asylum in a sanctuary controlled by Noritoshi Kamo. In any case, rather than advertising her offer assistance or security, Kamo subjected her to brutal tests. He constrained her to experience nine pregnancies and nine premature births, driving to the creation of the nine passing works of art. For the another 150 a long time, the passing portray wombs had no one to depend on but each other. They persevered a awful and forlorn presence. Choso, one of the passing portray wombs, clarifies to Iso and Kechizu that they ought to adjust themselves with the reviled spirits since the world they wish to make would be more reasonable for them. Given their history and circumstances, Nobara's sudden chuckling catches Iso and Kechizu off watch as she employments her straw doll procedure, reverberation on herself, causing hurt to both of them. She challenges them to play Amusement of Chicken, insulting them to persevere the torment. Nobara indeed energizes the reviled spirits to discharge their method in the event that the torment gets to be as well much for them. Iso considers whether he ought to discharge his procedure, realizing that Nobara's capacity turns the revile against its client. He moreover notes that no matter how numerous times Nobara employments reverberation on them, they won't kick the bucket, but since his rot method is still dynamic, they won't be able to move either. In any case, Yuji remains unaffected due to being Sukuna's vessel, the Lord of Curses, and having resistance to harm. This shocks Iso, clearing out him incapable to do anything as Yuji unleashes a torrent of reviled energy and fused punches on Kachizu, overwhelming him within the prepare. Within the strongly fight, as Yuji and Nobara exchange places, Iso catches a sea of his horrifyingly harmed more youthful brother, Kachizu, who was seriously harmed by Yuji's capable punches. Yuji proceeds his assault on Iso, but Iso oversees to square the blows and counter, sending Yuji flying. Within the process, Iso impulses deactivates his procedure to secure his brother. Iso enacts Wing Ruler once once more, attempting to constrain Yuji back. Be that as it may, Nobara, centered and unaffected by the deactivated technique's torment, remains aim on assaulting Kechizu. Sometime recently Wing Ruler can reach her, Yuji quickly lands before Iso, and they both channel their vitality to a millionth of a moment, enacting Dark Streak. This engaged assault sends a nail clean through Kachizu's head, murdering him immediately. Within the prepare, Iso's right arm is blown off totally. Troubled, Iso argues for his more youthful brother's survival. In the meantime, as Nobara turns around, Kachizu endeavors to require her life by attempting to eat up her from behind. But Nobara, in a minute of anger, actuates straw doll strategy, clip, exploding the nail in Kachizu's head, finishing his life. Nobara guarantees the dead Kachizu that Iso will be joining him within the, the Great Beyond. As Yuji moves to wrap up off Iso, the youthful alchemist is taken aback by Iso's tears of warmth for his misplaced brother. This unforeseen show of feeling makes Yuji stop. Nobara too stops assaulting, astounded that Kachizu's body isn't vanishing, recommending that he might still be lively. Both Yuji and Nobara come to realize that the passing works of art aren't only reviled spirits but tissue and blood creatures with feelings. As the pickup truck speeds absent, Iso takes one of the men on board prisoner and powers the driver to quicken, making it troublesome for Yuji to seek after them. Iso accepts he will recuperate and come back for Vindicate on Nobara, but he gets to be frightened when he sees her around to utilize her straw doll method on his disjoined arm. Sometime recently Iso can respond, Nobara actuates reverberation once more, causing even more harm to Iso's chest. Two dark nails puncture outward from his chest, causing him to break down and drop from the truck. Yuji surges toward him, apologizing, and after that conveys a last, destroying punch through Iso's chest, finishing his life. After the fight and with the passing canvases vanquished, Yuji takes note his hand burning from Iso's blood. He comments that it harms, but he suspects there's more to it than fare the torment from the blood. The circumstance takes off Yuji mulling over the occasions of the fight and the waiting impacts of the revile, and the curses themselves. As Choso faculties the passing of his brothers, he breaks one of the board diversion pieces, disillusioning Mahito. Dido is shocked by Choso's capacity to sense their passings, and Mahito goes to discover another amusement piece. When Gido affirms that both Iso and Kechizu were slaughtered by Yuji and his classmates, Mahito grins upon hearing this news. Meanwhile, at Yasuhachi Bridge, Akari tries to contact the first years, but none of them reply her phone calls, which pesters her. She chooses to go seek for them herself. Within the consequence of the fight, Yuji and Nobara walk through the Timberland in conversation around the passing portray wombs. Yuji checks to form beyond any doubt Nobara is okay, 
and she guarantees him that she's fine in spite of her scarred left arm and the plausibility of harm in her body. She ponders on the off chance that Shoko will be wakeful and calm sufficient to recuperate her wounds. Amid their discussion, Nobara takes note that Yuji is acting a bit bizarre. He inquires her in the event that this can be the primary time she has murdered somebody rather than fair exercising them. Whereas Yuji has done so some time recently with the transfigured people, Nobara doesn't appear to have a problem with it, showing her solid resolve in their line of work as Jujutsu magicians. Underneath the bridge, Yuji and Nobara discover Megumi oblivious, which stresses them. In any case, Megumi all of a sudden wakes up and communicates his alleviation that they are affirmed. <laughs> Yuji and Nobara chase and Megumi for terrifying them like that. Megumi lies down with a finger that has to be fixed as before long as conceivable. Nobara plans on calling Akari, and Yuji offers to eat the finger to urge freed of it. But Megumi is against it since they are uncertain how numerous fingers Yuji can handle. In step, Megumi chooses to provide the finger to Yuji to hold on to, as he has the foremost vitality. In any case, to their astonish, Sukuna makes a mouth on Yuji's palm, much to the stun and inconvenience of Megumi and Nobara. Before long after, Akari arrives on the bridge, shouting at the three, but they disregard her, encourage including to her disturbance. Two days afterward, Gojo talks on the phone with Yudaheim to check on the status of the mole inside the Jujutsu Tall School. He gloats approximately the victory of his understudies. Yudaheim reports that she hasn't found any leads exterior the understudies and will proceed her examination. Gojo at that point turns his consideration to Meimei for another matter and sends her 10 million yen, to which she cheerfully snickers out uproarious upon accepting the money. <laughs> As Megumi and Nobara examine the circumstance, Megumi uncovers that Sukuna's incarnation activated the Yasohachi Bridge Revile. He inquires Nobara not to tell Yuji almost it. In the meantime, Sukuna insults Yuji for causing the passings that happened amid the fight. In reaction, Yuji immovably tells Sukuna never to uncover this data to Megumi. Back at Tokyo Jujutsu Tall, Maki and Panda are preparing whereas Toge observes them. Panda sits down and inquires the two in the event that they are mindful of what happened with the first years, which Maki affirms. All of a sudden, Maki stands up and dispatches herself at the clueless Panda, shocking him with her assault. Toto and Mei Mei rejoin with the Kyoto Tall Foremost, Gakuganji, who clarifies the centrality of being a Review 1 magician. He notices that uncommon grades are irregularities among Jujutsu magicians, and Review 1 magicians are the ones who uphold the benchmarks of the most grounded alchemists. The missions they embrace and the perils they confront are at the next level, and the emolument reflects that, outperforming any rank underneath, counting semi-grade 1. With this in intellect, Gakuganji inquires Toto and Mei for their demands. They both put in a proposal for Yuji, Megumi, Nobara, Maki, and Panda to be advanced to review one magicians. In the interim, Yuji is out shopping with Nobara and Megumi when he incidentally drops something, much to Nobara's irritation. She shouts at him, and he rapidly apologizes, whereas Megumi turns around in humiliation. All of a sudden, Megumi gets a communication from Gojo Sensei, educating them that they are to meet up with him for a top secret mission. That concludes the anime recap of Jumping People 101 I mean Jujutsu Kaisen. Make sure you push that subscribe and let me know your thoughts below, I'm out. Yeah.